Double episode again, Rider fans! I needed the time to study for an exam, and it was time well spent since I got the Italian equivalent of an A+. Now, on with the review! Among the many frenemies Kota has made, the most prominent are Kaito and Michan, of course. Both have helped him and acted against him more than once, sometimes openly, sometimes in a covert way. There is, though, a fundamental difference between the two. Ever since the beginning, Michan has had a direction he was heading into, a well-defined path. Kaito! Not so much. I mean, he had one too, but now it's confusing. I just can't seem to get a proper light on him, and not in a good way. It's not that he's a character on the fence or that he just keeps you guessing. He's clearly a selfish asshole, but the way people react to him doesn't fit that description. I can only hope this gets resolved soon. As for Michan's resolution instead... Last time, thanks to Oren, Kota discovered that the new Zangetsu on the block is an impostor. The patissier is keen on convincing everyone of this. Really keen. But wait, Kaito and Minato know who he really is! But before they can drop the T-bomb on the group, where T stands for traitor, Michan comes back. Still, Kaito isn't opposed to make him squirm, while the others delve into further insanity thanks to a tsundere moment made in Junouchi. After an update intro, we move to the Yggdrasil Tower, where the Green Bishop is getting acquainted with our technology! And then right back to Game HQ. Micha confronts Minato and confesses his alliance with the Overlords. He offers Minato the opportunity to get on with the evil program, but she sees right through Darth's weather. He only wants her help to kill Kota, and Minato has no aspiration for the forbidden fruit anyway. Ruling is not their thing. Also, it's not Michan's either in her eyes. This causes Darth Sweater's anger to rise. How dare these people come into his home and cause turmoil? But Minato tells him the obvious. He's been lying, cheating and stealing worse than Eddie Guerrero. Bless you, Eddie. Rest in peace. The moment the truth comes out, he'll be left completely alone. Back in Helheim, the Green Bishop is showing the White King Zawami City. After watching a few images, he summons a bull overlord, I think, and orders him to follow the Green Bishop back to Earth. Upon inquiry, the White King tells Takatora that she, the Green Bishop, is a she? With that voice? Oh, 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 how was I supposed to... Damn you guy, you're screwing up my chest motif! Who's ever heard of a female bishop? <sighs> Anyway, Red Yu is trying to create a device using Earth's technology to revive Roshua's lover. This would make the Forbidden Fruit useless to him, and he would gladly let it go in exchange for the life of his queen. When Red Yu returns to Yggdrasil Tower, he finds a pretty furious mission. He wants reassurance about his future place as the factor ruler of humanity. Also, that the Old Lady's plan will actually work. I mean, what's stopping the White King from just using the fruit and be done with it? She assures him that that Roshua still has no idea how to use the fruit to resurrect his queen. We cut to Akira who's holed up in a gym with a few other survivors. Rather than deal with the most unconvincing kid actor ever, she ventures outside to look for help and she immediately fails her stealth check. CRITICAL FAIL! At Bandos, Kota decides to eat with Kaito and start a conversation about the golden fruit. Kaito reaffirms his will to be the one to pluck it. And Kota bends over and tells him that as long as the world is saved, he would gladly let him have it? That's completely insane! I mean, we'll get to that later. Anyway, Kato looks like uh, he wants to either say something or accept Kota's offer, but the dinner is interrupted by the Green Bishop Pat making a New Year's Eve speech on the TV. She gives the Wall of Earth an ultimatum, either become her willing subjects and toys, or evolve a taste for wood and grass as fast as fucking possible. And just as Kota and everyone else seem about ready to storm Yggdrasil Tower, Akira appears and asks for his help. 
Michan is, of course, not amused with the Grimby Chopette, since right now the world is probably considering how much trouble would it be to just nuke Kazawam and be done with it. Also, she finished the resurrection machine, damn it, that was fast, and sends Grinsha, which she renamed the Grey Horse, to acquire the needed few. Outside in the streets, Zack, Juno, Uchi and Doran find a bunch of investors not attacking, but kidnapping people, which makes me really want to use a solent green clip right now. Again, damn it, YouTube! Anyway, they protect the people, but soon find themselves greatly outnumbered, and then Zack gives Juno, Uchi a watermelon lock seed. Shenanigans happen! Like, a lot of shenanigans! At the same time, Kaito and Kota get to the gym where Akira was holding up just in time to see the Grey Horse attack the people inside. They transform and manage to create an opportunity for the people to escape... Except for the little annoying side quest, who sits by a barrel instead of running away from the monsters like every fucking else. Guess who gets in trouble because of him? Akira, of course! What, you two, she actually left to look for help? Nah, I bet this woman is so genuine savvy that she tried to put as much distance as possible between her and this little scrotum right here, specifically to avoid this. But, alas, it can be so. To protect the little shit, of course Kota misses the chance to rescue his sister. Cool triumphant arms, more unconvincing acting, I forget Tony Chan, and finally Zenith arms. The bull overlord actually proves himself to be the most troublesome opponent yet for Kota, but the double K tag team eventually finishes him off. Or they would have if the Green Bishopette didn't appear and protect her subordinate. After confirming that indeed she took a page out of the Matrix, she confesses that she did see the new option coming as a consequence of her speech. Actually, she was counting on it! Also, as the White King reveals to Takatora, it's not exactly an option anymore. IT'S ALREADY HAPPENING! And just when it seems that this series is heading for a pretty controversial recreation of Hiroshima, the White King does three things. One, he produces a sword out of nowhere. Two, stops every single missile in midair. And three, literally vaporizes them with a wave of the same blade! Mitchell summarizes that, yes, humanity is kind of boned as things are right now, which makes him giddy instead of desperate, like the extinction call. He will build his ideal world on top of the cinders! Oh, he's so gone off the deep end. After declaring that he only protected his investment in reduced resurrection machine, Roshua sets Takatora free. As a leader, it is his duty to go down with the ship. Returning to Kaito and Kota, they were just as confused by their sudden bout of luck. The bishop pet has a death note moment and then sets the restored Grey Knight on the two again. And then, awesome happens again! This is a bull invest. Kota has a red cape, hence, so Kamen Rider Krida! Once they limit his movements, the double K start wearing green shutdown bit by bit, and then the finisher! Seriously though, if the Red Knight and the Green Bishop Ed were Roshua's strongest subjects, why are their subordinates giving Kota more trouble than the Mushu did? Moving to the poor victim of damselification, Akira is brought to a room with other prisoners, including Rat and Rika. What the hell? No, seriously, Akira has had less screen time than these two. Why weren't we shown their disappearance? Why wasn't Kota worried about them? I, I actually like them. And don't try to distract me with green screenshots of Russia spreading Helheim plans all over the world and thus hastening Earth's destruction. Oh shit! Will someone do something already? Also, the missiles didn't just disappear, they were teleported to the United States and killed other people. That's just well! Hey, almighty leader Kaito, will you come up with a plan and storm that tower already? But in the end, it's Kota who gets their collective shell shock deaths together. Are you really, really sure that it's Kaito who keeps this group together, Mai? Look, he's even giving them an heroic speech! You don't get more leader than that! And what does Kaito say instead? Why bother saving the world when they attack us? Jesus Christ, and Kota wants to let this asshole take the golden fruit? Let's just switch to Takatora. His methods were wrong, but he did want to preserve a future for humanity. We get a nice character development moment, met with the destruction of Zawame and aware of what's going on in the rest of the world, is it with the full weight of his failure as a leader. He breaks down, but only for a moment. 
then it is Kota Kaito in Minato, and remembering what she did the last time they meet each other, he stops just before calling out to the Gaim Rider, he decides to shadow them for the time being. The three riders are trying to find an entrance into Yggdrasil Tower, but fail to find one not guarded by enemies. When all seems hopeless, Kota remembers that Michan has been scouting it alone, hence he must know a way in! And finally, finally, Kaito and Minato try to break the news to Kota. Michan is the team's Judah Iscariota. But of course, Kota won't hear it without some proof. And considering that he's one of his closest friends, it makes sense. Then a betting bet reminds them why you shouldn't talk exposition when a bunch of monsters are nearby. So much for sneaking past, they are now forced to force their way in. It's very short, but very awesome. Then they still don't head in, they'll need everyone for this. Change of scene, we find that Michan is already working on his Xanatos impression, he's brought Rata and Mika to his new office, and starts talking about his own version of Project Ark. The two won the jackpot, but it doesn't elaborate further. He then moves to Helheim Forest, where Radio has activated their machine to try and resurrect Rosho's lover, and just as we imagined, the fuel for it is the life force of the kidnapped people. They die, she lives! Michan gets reassured that Bishop Pet will leave alone the humans he chooses to save. Then he leaves to meet up with Mai, who's scavenging for supplies but still leaving money behind. Aww. He tells Mai that he's brokered a deal with the Overlord to save humanity and bring about coexistence between the two species. She's of course overjoyed, but then Darth Suit, is evolved from Sweaters finally, starts going more sociopathic by the sentence. Mai then asks the question, exactly what did he promise to help with? And he reveals that it's best the same as Yggdrasil. Most die or leave as toys, a few worthy ones survive. The girl, of course, can help but mention that Kota would strongly disagree. Michan tries to make Mai see that Kota is fighting a useless battle. He cannot win, he just puts others in danger. Even so, Mai doesn't go along with him just because she believes in the Gaim Rider. Michan can't understand why, and she tells him, plain and simple, that it's because Kota has never ever given up hope. No matter what happened to him, what he had to do, he kept on fighting, and she won't let him do that alone anymore. Then she tries one last appeal to bring him to their side again, but instead Michan decides this. If it's hope that stands in the way of their love, it's hope that will get destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, our villain. Back in Yggdrasil Tower, Rat and Rick are sneaking back to the fuel room, only to find, uh, well, refueling going on, with no way of stopping it and radio hanging in the background. Then, we move to our hero again. Kaito and Minato go ahead of Kota while he finishes a dinner he's not hungry for. Hell, he's not eaten anything the entire day, but he's still not hungry. Before Takatora can go and talk to him, Mitsuzane appears and asks to talk to him in private. They discuss Kota's hope. He wants to try and save the world without any further sacrifices, but Mitsuzane mocks him for it. According to him, considering the results, killing Yuya was a choice that Kota should have been proud of, and then kicks him in the face. He then starts vomiting every single dark toe going through his mind. How he only told Kota deserved Mai because he told the Gaim Rider would be able to make tough decisions. To be a realist, instead he held on to stupid hope. And then punches him in the face. Everything is happening under Takatora's eyes, of course. Michan starts transforming, revealing his identity as the impostor, while belittling hope as a disease. And Kota is the carrier that needs to be wiped out. He attacks Kota, continuing to talk about how everyone is being blinded by him. He finally states that he has to sacrifice the Gaim Rider to save everyone else, or better, to save mine. This finally makes Kota transform and fight back, and then the episode ends, of course! Arrgh! about a cliffhanger, things with Michan are finally coming to a close, at the cost of suspending the other subplot about the resurrection machine and man, this contained some great speeches. We finally get to the bottom line definition of what it is that makes people gravitate around Kota, it's not just that he's badass, it's not just that he's powerful, it's because he never ever gives up, he may fail and stumble, but he will never ever stop or compromise. By comparison, Michan has always been much more pragmatic, this, combined with a life of having to live up to people's expectations and a lack of liberty, 
well, you get to meet Suzanne. Now that his true nature has been revealed to both Kota and his brother, I can't wait for him to get his comeuppance. Mitsuzane is the kind of villain that I won't be satisfied with seeing redeemed. He's been so sneaky, so hateful and so deliciously evil that it would be disrespectful to his character development for him not to die at the ends of a hero. And now to the things that suck! First, this little shit! I knew, just from looking at him, that this kid would just be a plot device for Akira to heroically get in trouble. Seriously, what would have been wrong with her just getting picked off the streets? It's not like she has an image to uphold, uh, we only care about her because Kota does. A and again, why the fuck didn't we get to see Rika and Rat getting abducted again? They're Kota's friends and I actually like them as characters, they have personalities! And on that note, Kato does too and shit. Again, Kota, what the hell? Why do you trust this guy to save humanity? Seriously, there is something just wrong with Kaito. It's like everyone suddenly becomes stupid around him. You know what I think? I think that Kaito was supposed to become something else during the series then, maybe because he got popular or of other things, the writers were pressured into adding something else to his story. Hence, he's now a jumbled mess of different ideas and personalities that just feels off. Everything else in this series is harmonious, for good or worse. Kaito is the only stain on an otherwise pristine canvas. It, it bothers me to no end. The more we go on, the more evident it becomes, and I just hope that it doesn't ruin the finale. Well, that's the end of this double episode, Rider fans. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. They're my blood here on YouTube. Johnny!